Hello, friends. My name is Dwayne Lemon, and I wanted to share something very important with you from the Word of God that I believe will help us to know how we can truly be a people prepared to meet our God. I'm going to talk to you about a very important point, which is called the sealing work and its order. The Bible tells us in the book of Genesis, the fourth chapter, it gives us a story of how pretty much the world began as it started getting populated through the children of Adam and Eve. And the Bible says in Genesis, the fourth chapter, and I want you to consider this and turn there with me. And it says in Genesis chapter four, and I'm just going to go ahead and read verses one to ten. It says, and Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. It is an amazing thing to think that in the beginning of time, we find that the world was summarized into two classes of worshipers. We find the example of these classes through Cain and Abel. Cain was someone who worshiped God according to what he said, but not totally based on what he said. In other words, Cain represented the kind of worshipers that would do most of what God says, but not all of what God says. Abel, on the other hand, was different. Abel, he was also another class. Abel was one who worshiped God as well, but Abel did his worship according to exactly what God had said. This was the marked difference between Cain and Abel. Abel was a class of worshiper who did exactly what God says. Cain was a class of worshipers who did most of what God said, but also some of what he wanted. As a result of this, Cain's worship, Cain's offering was rejected. Abel's offering was accepted. And as a result of this polarization made by God, literally brother began to persecute brother. And this is how the Bible records the beginning of time as it relates to classes of worshipers. What is interesting about this is that the Bible lets us know a very important principle and is found in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter one. It is in Ecclesiastes chapter one when we consider verse nine that Solomon the wise man made a statement that we would do well to consider. Solomon says, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Now, if we think about this verse, we would have to break it apart. And what you'll see is that the Bible says, the thing that hath been, well, that's the past, is that which shall be, well, that's the future. And that which is done, that's presently, is that which shall be done, well, that's future again. And there's no new thing under the sun. What is it that Solomon was trying to teach us through this text? The reality is this, history has a tendency to repeat itself. And what we just looked at in the book of Genesis, in the beginning of time, we saw brothers who claimed to worship the same heavenly father, but at the same time, one was doing exactly what God says, while there was another class that did some of what God says, but some of what they wanted. One class was rejected, another class was accepted, and as a result of this, it caused brother persecuting brother. And the reason why this historical point is important is because you're going to see it's not just past truth, it's actually present truth. How do we know this? Because we just looked at Ecclesiastes 1.9. There's no new thing under the sun. That which hath been is that which shall be. You see, the same way our world started, the Bible makes it clear, is the same way our world shall end. And we know this by looking at the book of the last book of the Bible, which is none other than the book of Revelation. It is in Revelation, the 13th chapter, that the Bible makes it very clear 
that the same way that the world began is the same way that the world is going to end. Remember, the world began with two classes of worshipers, those who did exactly what God says and those who did some of what God says, but also some of what they wanted. There was a mixture of God's righteousness with self-righteousness. But the problem is we don't understand that self-righteousness is like the worst poison. It only takes one drop of cyanide to make an entire glass of pure water poison. It takes just one drop of self-righteousness that can cause God's righteousness to become null and void. Well, here it is that in Revelation, the 13th chapter, the Bible spells out the very last moments of Earth's history and how things will unfold. And we would do well to consider it as we look at Revelation 13. And we're going to start right at verse 1. The Bible says in Revelation 13 and verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now watch verse 3 carefully. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Now here it is that the Bible is speaking about what I'm going to refer to as a first beast. And the reason why is because you're going to notice that when we get to verse 11 of this same book and chapter, it introduces another beast. And notice what it says about the first beast. It says that he's going to have all of these different characteristics of animals that were listed in the book of Daniel, the seventh chapter, which will more than likely be discussed in another study. It states that the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard and he had the feet of a bear and he had the mouth of a lion. Anyone who reads Daniel, the seventh chapter, knows that this is talking about none other than those great kingdoms that Daniel was given vision to see as it related to the future. Daniel was living in the time of the lion, which was none other than Babylon. Then after Babylon came the bear, which was none other than Medo-Persia. And then came the leopard, which was none other than Greece. And then after that, there was a fourth beast. It was an indiscreet beast. It was so terrible that God could not connect an animal to it. So therefore, it was simply called a great and terrible beast. Well, this beast represented none other than Rome. And here it is that now John the Revelator, he's living in the time of Rome. And he's living in the time of this sea beast. But it's like the lion. It's like the bear. It's like the leopard. So it's like Babylon. It's like Medo-Persia. It's like Greece. But this is none other than Rome. So the Bible in Revelation is talking about this sea beast power, which is none other than Rome. And Rome, it says, is going to work with great and mighty power. But a time was going to come that it was going to suffer a deadly wound. But in a period of time, the wound would be healed and all the world will begin to wonder and worship after Rome. Well, the Bible goes on to say in Revelation 13 and verse 11, it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, that's Rome, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. It says, going on in verse 15, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So then we can see that in Revelation 13, these two powers are coming together. They're battling over the mind of man so that man will worship, wonder, and ultimately receive the mark of the beast. Now remember, in the beginning of our study, we saw two classes of worshipers in the beginning of time. We're now seeing in Revelation 13, a class of worshipers in the end of time. These class of worshipers are those who worship the beast and his image and ultimately receive the mark of the beast. So this makes up one of the two classes that we should expect to see in these very last moments of Earth's history. This class we are going to call those who receive the mark of the beast. 
But the Bible makes it clear that even though it says in Revelation 13, 3, that all the world will wonder after the beast, it is not truly all the world, meaning everybody that's in it. Because notice how the Bible qualifies this statement in Revelation 17. It is in Revelation 17 and verse 8 that it talks about individuals who wonder after the beast. And I want you to see what it says. It says in Revelation 17 and verse 8, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder. Now notice this, whose names were not written in the Lamb's book of life. The individuals who receive the mark of the beast are those who worship the beast. The individuals who worship the beast were those who were wondering after the beast. We just found that the individuals who wonder after the beast are those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. So this is the qualifier. It is not that all the world is going to wonder after the beast, meaning every individual on the planet, but it's every individual on the planet that have rejected God's message of grace, that have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, that have rejected God's present truth for this time. Those who have rejected God, these are the ones that ultimately their names will not enter that Lamb's book of life. But these are the ones that will unfortunately receive the mark of the beast, worship the beast because they wondered after the beast. And therefore, there will be a class that will not wonder after the beast. And you and I need to know how the Bible describes them. It's found in Revelation chapter three. It is in Revelation, the third chapter, when God was giving a description of messages that was given to all the churches in Asia Minor. That the Bible says in Revelation chapter 3, right there in verse 5, it lets us know the class of individuals that will not receive the mark of the beast because they didn't worship the beast, because they did not wonder after the beast, because their names were in the book of life. But notice the qualifier. In Revelation 3 and verse 5, the Bible says, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. So the Bible makes it clear that if you overcome and if I overcome, well, there's only one thing to overcome and that is sin. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Keep us falling into sin. Matthew 1 21, it says, and they shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. So there will be a class of people in the last days they're going to be very different from the group that receives the mark of the beast. They will be recognized by God as overcomers. But notice this. What then would this group receive? Because remember, two classes. First class has the mark of the beast. Well, the overcomers, what is it that they have? Let's notice what the Bible says as we consider Revelation, the seventh chapter. In Revelation, the seventh chapter, the Bible helps us know what these overcomers, what they're going to receive. And notice what the Bible says in very plain language as we consider Revelation 7, verses 1 to 3. It says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So notice that the Bible makes it very clear that not everybody in the last days is going to have the mark of the beast. But there will be a group of overcomers. There will be a group of individuals who love Jesus so much that they were willing to follow him wheresoever he would lead. And as a result of this experience with Christ, they would overcome the power of sin. And as a result of that, they would receive the seal of the living God. We have just identified the two classes. In the beginning of time, one class did exactly what God says, and they were rewarded. Another class, they did almost what God says, most of what God says, but they were also negligent in the very details of what God says. Their worship was rejected. As a result of this, brother persecuted brother. And the same way that the world began, the Bible makes it clear, is the same way that this world is going to come to its end. And you and I have a decision to make because no matter what, if we are alive when these things unfold, which are right upon us, we are either going to receive the mark of the beast or the seal of the living God. And the question is, which one do you want?
Well, I would imagine if you had sense, and if I had sense, we would definitely say, well, I want the seal of God. Because those who get the mark of the beast, the Bible says they suffer the wrath of God. And we don't want that. So therefore, if you want the seal of God, we're now going to transition into the next phase of our study. How do you get it? Just because you want something in life does not mean that by default you get it. So therefore, we have to ask ourselves, how do I get the seal? Well, the Bible does not leave us aloof to this question. Notice what it says again as we look at Revelation 7 and verse 3. Look carefully at it. It says, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the seed nor the trees, till we have sealed the what? It says servants of our God in their forehead. So the first thing that we learn is that no one gets the seal of God unless they first are servants of God. Well, that means that there's no more spectating. That means we can no longer sit back and expect ministers and other people to do the work of the gospel. Jesus gave a commission to every believer, and the commission is you go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and teaching those who to observe all things whatsoever he has commanded us, and lo, God is with us, even unto the end of the world. Amen. This commission has been given to all Christians, all believers, and God wants us to play a part in his work. But somebody says, okay, well, so then you're saying that if I start singing on a choir, or maybe if I start doing some Bible studies, if I start preaching, or maybe I hold some type of evangelistic meetings, is this enough for me to get the seal? Well, no, not exactly. And let me show you why. The Bible says in Matthew, the 24th chapter, something very important as it relates to servants. And I want you to see it because God does not want you to be deceived. And as your brother, I don't want you to be deceived either. The Bible says in Matthew, the 24th chapter, there's a picture that Jesus gives of individuals in his church in the last days. And they are both servants, but they have very different endings. The Bible says in Matthew, the 24th chapter, we're going to go ahead and consider verse 44. The Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 44, therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as you think not the son of man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord when he cometh shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Well, notice here goes one servant that is called faithful and wise. So notice there's a faithful and wise servant in God's house. But now watch the transition in verse 48. It says, but and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of. And he shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. And there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Here goes two servants, both in the house of God, one faithful and wise, the other evil. In other words, it's not enough to serve. There are many individuals that think that they are children of God just because they serve. But the Bible says, yes, there are individuals in the house of God that serve, but many of them are evil servants. And therefore, it's not enough then to serve just because I do Bible studies, just because I preach the word, just because I give out books and tracts, just because I sing on a choir does not mean that I'm a child of God. And therefore, because of this, it's not enough to serve. We have to make sure that we serve right. And you know the best way to do that? There's no better way to do that than to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And someone may say, well, why Jesus? Well, I have the answer for you. Go to the book of Philippians chapter two. You see, it is in Philippians, the second chapter, that we find the very reason why Christ makes up the best servant. You see, the Bible says in Philippians, the second chapter, and we're going to consider verses five to seven. The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a what? It says the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. You see, when Jesus walked on this earth, he walked as a servant. And therefore, if we want to serve in a way that we know in the end of it, we can receive the seal. 
I would submit unto you, then we need to serve how Jesus served. And the question is, how did he serve? You know, most of us today, when we think of Jesus in service, we think of him feeding thousands who were hungry. When we think of Jesus serving, we think of Jesus who went about doing good and healing all manner of sickness and disease, casting out devils. When we think of Jesus and his servanthood, we think of him putting little children on his lap and teaching the words of God in pure simplicity. But while all of these points about the life of Jesus and his servanthood are beautiful, I would submit unto you that before Jesus did any of these things we just mentioned, there's a form of service that we have not yet considered. And what is this form of service? I want to read a quotation to you from the book Desire of Ages, page 74, as we prepare to close. It says in Desire of Ages, page 74, and it's right in the very fourth paragraph. It says, Jesus is our example. There are many who dwell with interest upon the period of his public ministry while they pass unnoticed the teaching of his early years. It says, but it is in his home life that he is the pattern for all children and youth. The Bible makes it very clear and inspiration makes it very clear that before Jesus served in the community, before Jesus served in the church, the first place that Christ served was in his home. Jesus understood that I am no good to men outside my home if I am not first good to those inside my home. In the Ministry of Healing, page 350, we are told the Savior's early years are more than an example to the youth. They are a lesson and should be an encouragement to every parent. The circle of family and neighborhood duties is the very first field of effort for those who would work for the uplifting of their fellow men. How clear is this? It goes on to say there is no more important field of effort than that committed to the founders and guardians of the home. It says no work entrusted to human beings involves greater or more far reaching results than does the work of fathers and mothers. There are so many individuals that are so busy trying to preach and teach and share with the world at large while our homes are on their way to hell. And God says that we are serving out of order. God wants us to understand that while it is imperative to get the gospel to the masses, while it is important to bring revival and reformation in the church, God says, what about your home? Parents, what about your children? Brothers and sisters, what about your siblings? Husbands, what about your wives? Wives, what about your husbands? If we know that there are individuals that are in our homes that are in a lost condition, God says, this is where your money, this is where your effort, this is where your energy should be put first and foremost. And many of us, we are working out of order. Some of us are living totally selfish lives where we don't even serve anybody. Well, God says we will never get the seal. But then there are others who are in ministry and they're busy. But brothers and sisters, we are busy working to save others while we are watching our own children go to hell. We're watching our own husbands and wives go to hell. And God says this is out of order. So may the Lord help us today that by his grace, let us put our homes first. Let's find out how can I minister to my son, my daughter? How can I once again win my children back to my heart? How can I win my brother, my sister, my husband or wife back into the arms of Jesus? And you will find that if we serve as Christ served, we will receive what Christ received. And that is eternity. May God bless you. Maranatha.